first I want to kind of give an account of myself for not being here next week and to let you know that I won't be loafing <laughs> because I don't even know how to loaf. In fact, I need a lesson in knowing how to rest, let alone loaf. I will be in Durham, North Carolina, delivering a lecture on a panel. This is the 20th anniversary of the publication of Hal Cruz's book, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. And I will deliver a paper on the crisis that Hal Cruz neglected. Because Hal Cruz wrote a very interesting book, a very personal book, but he did not deal with the real crisis of the black intellectual. The real crisis of the black intellectual started a long time ago and it's still there. The crisis of uh, not studying the intentions of other people toward us. The crisis of welcoming in future conquerors without knowing they are conquerors. The crisis of making bad alliances and uh, no alliances at all the crisis of letting other people come into his house and take down the good things about him, his religion, his culture, and sometimes his wife, and get away with it. We've been all too kind to people. Hal Cruz writes about the 20th century. I start at the 18th century, B.C., and work straight up. We made a whole lot of mistakes in choosing friends and in choosing religions that were ours in the first place. People take the basis of religions from us, go away and dress them up and come back a few hundred years later and sell them to us as something new. We don't know it was ours in the first place. You should really read St. Augustine in his comments after the conference at Nicaea when the Europeans took over Christianity and began to whiten it up. He said the whole thing made him laugh. These people are trying to give us a religion we had 3,000 years ago. We had not only one Christ, we had many Christs, many deities. And I want to deal with the inability of a lot of African scholars to really deal in depth with the Hebrew entry in the Bible itself, a Jewish survival book, a book of wisdom. I'm not doubting that, but a book that the creators deserted because they dare not have the temperament to obey what's in the book. We might yet be the last humanitarians in the world because we were the first humanitarians in the world. We have a crisis around integration. We should have asked for justice and let integration take care of itself. Had we asked for justice and been selective we would not have integrated ourselves out of existence in so many different places. Many of the black colleges are being taken over in the name of integration, especially the black state schools. The black state schools are being overrun with inept white teachers who can't teach any other place, and they go into black schools and do no teaching and get paid for it. We misunderstood what it meant to be with them. We quite forget that some of us are far more competent than some of them, especially in some areas where we've been the masters in the field of teaching and in the fields of sciences, in the field of basic mechanics. I think this is a subject that needs to be dealt with. 
because there's a reoccurring crisis. There's a crisis of ideology in our life. We're always choosing other people's ideologies and neglecting our own. This is why Ghana is not the great example nation that it could have been, not the great beating heart of Africa that it could have been. I'm a great admirer of Nkrumah, but he chose too many outside ideas and outside advisors, and he neglected the advice of his great school teacher, schoolmaster, Joseph B. Danqua, who kept telling him, you can have a modern state, but you need a traditional African state, and you need traditional African values. And he kept saying that uh, as for socialism, there's only scientific socialism. Nothing is scientific that fails to work for you, no matter what, who, who people call, what people call. Now, one thing our intellects have not learned, that nothing the European mind ever devised was meant to do anything but to facilitate European control over the world. The European wastes no time in humanity or sympathy. He wants to control and he will control by any means necessary or he will destroy. He shares nothing with nobody. He never enters into partnerships with other people. And if you think that he's going to enter into a partnership with you, no matter what he calls himself, capitalist, Marxist, or socialist, or anything, he came to control. Under any guise, he must control. And once you understand that, you have to understand, no matter what religion I belong to, no matter what denomination I belong to, no matter what political ideology I follow, my people must always be in charge of themselves. They must be the masters of themselves. And any ideology, any religion, anything that fails to serve that purpose is a waste of our time. All our energy needs to be converted into that. And this is the confusion of what we call our intellects. The role of the teacher, the intellect, the preacher, the role of any kind of leader is to make sure his people know the time of day, the political time of day, the emotional time of day, and the historical and cultural time of day. Make sure his people are trained in how to face reality. And if you face reality right now, you will realize that you are living in a society that is dying. The society is not only dying, the society intends for you to die with it. They'll take you down with it. And that you have within your own mind and within your own body the ability to make a whole new world. But you have to stop answering to stupid names like Negro and uh, minority. You ain't no minority. There's only two people on the face of this earth that might have a billion people, the Chinese and us. When you count all of us, including those millions in the Pacific, millions throughout South America, the Caribbean Island, the United States, and Africa, we might have a billion people. Somebody say, minorities. Answer to minorities every time somebody's going to give away some money. <laughs> Anytime they're going to give a minority something, you become a minority, get the money. <laughs> After that, <laughs> go ahead and be the majority that you are, because that's what you are. All right, now, didn't mean to digress that long, but 
And as much as those other people don't own me, I figure you do. And I have to... <laughs> um, so I have to kind of let you know what's happening to me when I'm acting. I'm not copping out. Because when I had a stroke a few years ago, in 82, I turned to African people and I got from my sisters and brothers the strength to pull myself together, get out of that bed and get back on the road again and to fulfill my mission as a teacher. I never want to be called leader because I have a hard time leading my two teenagers when they were teenagers. <laughs> Only 122 right now. I sure have never led my wife. So that's, that's how. <laughs> so, I'll, so I'll confess my failure as a leader. But as a teacher, as a community activist, I think I've inspired a few students to do some good, because from my classroom it's come, has come three ambassadors, almost 20 doctors, three doctors in Harlem Hospital right now, former students of mine, the night uh, um, uh, chief of pediatrics at hospital in Syracuse, one of my girl students came up to me at Hunter College and said, Professor Clark, I was in your class in the 70s. I said, yes, ma'am, what are you doing now? I thought she was some little mouse housewife. <laughs> and she said that <laughs> I'm a chief of pediatrics at hospital in, uh, in Syracuse. Another student of mine is chief of abdominal surgeon, surgery at Denver General Hospital. So I was sent out there a whole lot of people with their minds pretty straight who rendered some, some service. And so I don't mind being the property of a people because I think service, especially to your own people, is the highest calling. And to be a teacher. <laughs> So I don't mind you asking me, well, if you're not going to be here, well, what are you going to be? <laughs> that, that's your responsibility. <laughs> Ain't hanging out, not at your age, are you? <laughs> Give an account of yourself. What are you, where are you going to be? That's family. Yeah. And the other folks ask me, I get insulted. But you ask me, I feel you just interested enough and care enough for to know where I am. All right, let's get into the lecture on the Civil War and its aftermath. Let's look at the period that we're talking about. We're talking about the middle of the 19th century, the 1850s. This is the period that we're talking about. This nation that failed to get a rebirth during the constitutional conferences have now been offered a chance to straighten itself up and be born again. Slavery and immigration is spreading to the western part of the United States. And some of the poor whites who didn't benefit from slavery are saying, we don't want that out here. And not because they love blacks, because they didn't, but they didn't see any benefit for them in having slavery. So they said that as we move to the West and make new nations in the West, we'd rather do it without slavery. And besides, we can do our own labor. They were poor people. They couldn't afford slaves anyway. And so when they opened up Kansas, 
the poor whites of Kansas began to fight, began to fight against slavery because they did not want to create still another slave state. And they call it bloody Kansas. And a lot of blacks went into Kansas because they thought that they wouldn't be slaves. But some of the slaveholders and those with the power to enforce their will had gone into Kansas and had set up shop there trying to create a new slave state in Kansas. These are blacks who went into Kansas, it was called exodusters. They did not exit from the United States, but <coughs> they exited from their homes within the United States. Now, among us, we had not settled the problem of whether we would or would not stay in the United States. This was the period of Martin Delaney, the period of Robert Campbell, the period of blacks sending delegations out to Africa to look for a place for settlement. It was a period of another shift in population. After the American Revolution, it was discovered that over 5,000 blacks had fought against the United States with the British. And they became unpopular when the British lost the war. So the British had to get them out of here. The British had sent them to an icebox called Nova Scotia. And they, the part of that community is still there. But some of the blacks rebelling against this cold climate asked to be sent elsewhere, so they went to Sierra Leone in West Africa. Liberia is just being open, and so many blacks from the Caribbean, some from the United States, are now going to Liberia. Liberia was officially opened 1847. Now what we're trying to look at are the events in the African world on the eve of this war. In South America, the two great states brought into being by slaves especially in Brazil, had now been more or less broken up or fragmented by the Portuguese, Palmeiras and Bahia. At Palmeiras, they had fought, and not only fought lo so long, and it started before the American Revolution, blacks had discovered a republic and no black preached about anything called democracy. But when the whites came into Palmeiras, when they agreed to let them in, they treated them with democracy. They didn't say, here, look, my mom treating the white man like with democracy. They just went and treated him with democracy. See, we don't preach about something. If you believe something, you don't have to announce it. You just do it. And they just did it, and ultimately, one of those whites would betray them, and the rest of Palmeiras was destroyed. Now, Uz or, um, Bahia, the other state, had been beaten to its knees and surrendered. That, that is still a predominantly black area of Brazil. In the West Indies, especially Jamaica, the pivotal state island in the West Indies, the pivotal political island in the West Indies, two islands, Jamaica and Haiti. These are the islands that literally determine the direction of the totality 
of the Caribbean. Jamaica was not at a standstill, but the rebels in Jamaica had fought for many years. Haiti was already free, having been free in the set begin in the 1700s in that 20 year period became free but I'm saying that Africans in the whole of the world were inspired by the Haitian Revolution the Haitian Revolution over now and the mulattoes who were to ruin Haiti with a French constitution in power now. But blacks still remembered there was a time when blacks drove out whites and established a republic. And except for the offsprings of the whites, that republic might have endured, but no one impressed them with an African mode constitution, but with a French constitution. Now what you need to read here, if you read French and part of it's been translated, the Rochambeau papers. Rochambeau came into Haiti, so-called tame the blacks. And Rochambeau had played up to them, but he hated both the mulattoes and the blacks. And in a fight against him that he won after the mulatto generals favored the French, hoping the French would give them favors over the blacks, Rochambeau played a trick on the mulatto generals. He had a ball and he invited the wives of all these generals. And at the end of the ball, he escorted them into a room to stand by a box. I got a present for you. And they opened the box and the heads of their husband was in each box, which proved that no one gains with the internal struggle by thinking you're going to lighten your load by betraying the others. Now, finally, a black general drove out Rushambo. But Haiti fell again into the hands of the offsprings of the French. While the Haitians spoke a language that is Creole, part French, part of everything, there was a group of human beings called Creoles who were Haitians and black. Now, <laughs> Haiti, by the middle of the century, is no more as a vibrant inspiration to the African world because their constitutions are so mangled, and those who had been educated in France spent so much time trying to be French. They couldn't be African. Now, 1850 in, in Jamaica, the Jamaican Colors has an excellent book on it. Uh, Mavis Campbell, who's also just given us a recent book on the Maroons. And who, she's really one of Jamaica's finest woman writers one of the finest writers, period. Uh, great researcher. Not the easiest person to get along with because she's a, really a black English woman. <laughs> and her values are 
that of an English woman. But she is a master researcher. She'll trace a fact down like a hound dog until she find out what the beginning and the end of it. And when she come up with it, ain't nothing left to be found that she don't she hasn't got. And she's been working five years on this one book on the maroons. She even calls the maroons my maroons. And she owns them. <laughs> oh, no. But now, 1850 in Jamaica, we're dealing with the period that led to the Civil War all over the world. In Jamaica, that group tried to make a deal with the English that if you favor us and give us certain basic privileges, you won't have to worry about the blacks because we will protect you from the blacks. The British didn't give them the deal. Then the British had some second thoughts about it because many of them now joined the blacks and began agitation with the blacks. By 1865, the Jamaicans understood that their emancipation was a phony that you be emancipated, now you're a free man. You got to take care of yourself, your clothing, your family, and everybody else. All the things now you got to do for yourself. You got no job, no other island. You got no other island to go to. So you have to go back to the same farm where you were a slave to get a job. The planters got the best of the deal. Now this caused more anger. And this anger would reach fruition around 1865 in the Moret Bay confrontation. But my point is on the eve of the Civil War and as an aftermath of the Civil War, African people were consistently in revolt. Now in Africa itself, the Zulu Wars had started, having started early in the 1800s, Chaka, had lived and died, having died in 1828. Chaka's successor, Dingong, is now in power. Dingong, you, people think of Chaka, the great Zulu, as opposition to the whites. That means you misread history. Chaka never fought in the whites. Chaka fought blacks to consolidate blacks to save the country for the blacks. Had he won, there'd been no South African problem because there wouldn't be nobody in South Africa but blacks. But he didn't win. And his successor, an assassin, half-brother, <laughs> took over. And he began the opposition to the whites, the Dutch, who wanted to move away from the coast and to find a separate republic on the other side of the Vale River called Transvaal. They did establish the republic that's still in existence. But before that, they had to defeat Dengang, who had stopped them three times. Now the British realized that if any African defeated any whites, all whites were in danger. Now the British hated the, the guts of the Dutch then and now, but the British came to the defense of the Dutch against Dingong. And Dingong met them on the Vell River, gave a splendid account of himself, but shields and spears 
are no match for cannons. But Ding Gong butchered so many bodies and threw them in the river until the river streaked with blood and they renamed it the Blood River. But now, with the help of the British, the Dutch defeated him, drove him into exile, 1838, and he died 1840. So now, with the death of Dingon, the British would bring to power a puppet, M. Panday. M. Panday violated all the rules used to govern a Zulu king. He married into, into families, wasn't designated for the king. The king had to marry to a certain family. Certain goods raised from birth to be wives of the king. He didn't marry them. He married other women and he changed them regularly. He was a fat beer drinking slob. <laughs> and he was so ignorant, the British made out his death warrant and put it before him and he signed it. But in the 1870s, this weakling produced a strong son, and his people overthrew him in favor of the son. His name, Ketchewayo. It was Ketchewayo that reorganized the Zulus into a fighting force and met the British, literally defeating them in one of the decisive battles for the control of South Africa, the Battle of San Helvina, made the mistake many Africans make. He went to England after that to see the Queen. <laughs> and while he was in England seeing the Queen, the British broke his country up into 13 different parts, and he couldn't communicate with them after that. He subsequently died. The main point is to point to events in the African world on the eve of the Civil War in the aftermath of these events. The British in Ghana, then called the Gold Coast, decided that they would uh, take the religious ornament of the God, the most sacred of all, the golden stool, brought by a great priest, a Kumfu Enochi, but the British decided they would take it because they said the spirit of the Ghanaian people rests in the stool. And the priest told them, if you lose the stool, you lose your soul and the people will die. The British hearing of this legend decided the best way to break the spirit of the Shanty people is to take the stool. Now, they had tried first in 1805. A young governor na named McLean decided he would go up and show the British he can take the stool. The king, Osara Tutu Kawamine, sent word back, if you come up here, I will send your head back to the coast on a silver platter. So the fool kid did come to Kumase, the headquarters of the Santi people, and Kwamene did cut his head off and send it to the coast on a silver platter. He expected war, and this was the beginning of the Asante Wars that lasted through the exile of Prempe where the British burned down Kumase twice and still could not defeat them. But the last in the series of wars did not end until 1901, led by a woman, Ye Asantiwa. She held the British at bay for nine months 
asking no quarter, giving no quarter. She laid the basis for modern Ghana. Because once she was exiled, having been defeated by the famous Caribbean regiment, called the, then called the West Indian Regiment, she wasn't defeated, but when she saw them, she thought her brothers were coming from the West to help her. So she told her soldiers, oh, our brothers from the West coming to help us at last, none too soon. <clears throat> she didn't know that they were in the pay of the British and they were soldiers of the British. So one flank opened fire under a white lieutenant and another flank refused to fire so we didn't come here to fight our own people. But after this she gave up. The British exiled her to Seashell Islands in the Red Sea to join her cousin, Prempe. But the, a young Ghanaian politician, Kaysla Hayford, started a campaign for the return of the exiled kings and queens. And out of this campaign, he converted it into a campaign for independence. In 1931, when he died, he called for his successor. This is a custom in Africa to train your successor. He called for JP, that's John, Joseph B. Donqua. Joseph B. Donqua is the man that trained in Kruma originally. And the one who sent in Kruma money to London to come home when he found that the student was graduated to colleges and but he was broke in London. He's the one that sent in Krumah money to come home, Joseph B. Dunqua. And Joseph B. Dunqua had built the political party out of which Nkrumah would take the CPP. That's a bigger story and there's other time to tell it. But Nkrumah really took the young people out of the convention, out of the Gold Coast Convention, United Gold Coast Convention, and formed the Convention People's Party. That angered his schoolmaster. All right, now, in North Africa, another drama unfolding the results of the Ottoman occupation of Egypt had left Egypt saddled with a royal family of Armenian and Turkish descent. And among the outstanding leaders, outstanding or famous but not righteous, a man named Muhammad Ali. That was his name, same as the fighter. When I brought this up to Muhammad Ali, I said, do you know you've taken the name of, of an Arab, of a, of, a, of a slave trader? He said, well, Elijah Muhammad gave me the name. Well, Elijah Muhammad needed to read some history. <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad Ali was a slave trader, and the man that tried to destroy all of the old objects of Egypt. Don't give me no old bones and stone. Give me something new. Had no respect for the ancient history of Egypt. Egypt then had invaded the Sudan, where the Muslims of the Sudan of another Muslim group told the Egyptians, your dogs and running dogs of imperialism, and that you poor Muslims, ally will strike you dead. You know, that you violated our faith because no one Muslim is supposed to turn on another Muslim. And you've done the sacrilegious thing by coming down here trying to conquer the Sudan. 
ultimately the, the, the Egyptians got stuck in the Sudan and the British had to rescue them and subsequently the British ended up ruling the Sudan. So all over the world we are fighting wrongly or rightly but we are fighting in the West Indies In this country, in Africa, nobody is sleeping during this period. Nobody slept during this century. This was a century of greater black alertness than we have right now. And yet, this is the time when a great Caribbean scholar left St. Thomas and St. Croix, went out to Africa to find his African relatives. Not only found them, but found the condition under which they were enslaved. His name is Edmund Viltmont Blyden. Blyden went back to Liberia where he became president of Liberia College. And in his famous inaugural address, 1881, he called attention to some of the tragedies we have not finished or addressed ourselves to, to today. We strive to be those things most unlike ourselves. We feed grist into other people's mills and don't take care of those things that belong to us. He said, this is our, he said, nothing comes out except what has been put in. Then this, he said, is our great sorrow. So now, at the middle of the, uh, of, of the um, 19th century, we're facing an ideological conflict. The independent church is getting underway because we want to distinguish ourselves from African people. We stopped calling ourselves African people, and though when we found the independent church, we call the independent church African. African Methodist Episcopal, African Methodist Zion, African Cutter, Africa, but African. And our comedians were called the African rascals and the Ethiopian clowns. We were not afraid of the word African. Right. Now we began to use the word color, <laughs> which could mean anything or nothing. And later on, the word Negro, which is not a word for people at all. Some lazy Spaniard or Portuguese took a descriptive adjective and made a noun out of it, slapped it on the people. And when you answer to what you are not, you become what you are not. <clears throat> Richard B. Moore, in his little book, uh, The Name Negro, Its Origin and Evil Use, said, slaves and dogs are named by their masters. Free men name themselves. So the proper name for a people must always relate to land, history, and culture. And any time anyone calls you by a name that hasn't got Africa in it any place, they have called you out of your name. And you are offended, or should be. Now, we are solving some of these problems and we are creating new problems. But we are, oh, we are looking on while white people have an argument, and we've done this before and we're still doing it, like some blacks said, our astronauts. <laughs> mm. 
we still hear conversations among whites and we assume that they're talking about us. They ain't even thinking about us. The Constitution, the Constitution said we were three-fifths of man. And nobody ever said that we are not. What and why must we pay taxes if we're not even full human beings? We can make a good case for not paying taxes. Because I don't think we're ready to test it. <laughs> One day some wild man who don't care much for God or the devil is going to put it to a test. You don't care what comes after just as long as it's tested. I make a good case for blacks not having to pay taxes. Besides, you collected it already. All those 300 years, you didn't give me no salary. You got your money. <laughs> All right. Now, on the eve of the Civil War, slavery is an emotional issue. The Douglas-Lincoln debates the talk with Frederick Douglass himself, still alive. Slavery is an issue and a debate. But the real issue leading to the Civil War was not slavery. These northern city slickers who came here with a little money and the southerner didn't come here with nothing, not even a decent rag on his body. I have said before, Europe dumped its human garbage can into the so-called New World. The worst of that garbage can was dumped into the United States. Now, in the South, debtors, prisoners, women from wash houses, nobody. Marrying Anglo-Saxon women whenever they would, so they can call themselves Anglo-Saxon, looking for a social status from some place. Slavery and cotton took them out of that degradation so fast that they were dressed up and didn't even know how to use a fork. Didn't know what to do at a banquet. Now, these Southerners that had grown rich on our back <clears throat> now had a conflict. The Northerners wanted the Southerners to become furnishers of raw material for the North. If the Southerners asked, and rightly so, in as much as the cotton is here in the South, why not put the textile mills down here? The New Englanders say, oh no, we got mills up here. You send the cotton up that wheel, Jan. We'll take care of the furnishing, the finishing. You just take care of the producing. Some of the great forests then in the South a lot of the wood, the building materials were coming from the South. The South was a furnisher of things. The embryo of American industry was just getting underway. Most of the coal was coming from the South. And the South wanted a share of the wealth of the country. And when the northerners, liberal types, underwrote the work of the Quakers trying to take the slaves away from the southerners, the southerners said that you are northern hypocrites. You sold me the slave, made money from it, and you used part of that money to try to take the slave away from me. I said, no, I'm, no, I'm not going to do it. 
It was not that the South was more principled than the North. It was not that either, neither, neither one of them had any principle. We have none now. <laughs> it's just up South and up down South. The country is basically the same. But the moneyed people who sell in the United States, escaping persecution, so-called, their words, generally settled in the New England states. The poor whites of Europe generally settled in the South. Now they got a footing out of slavery and the exploitation of a lot of white slaves too, especially Irish and Slavs and some Germans. Slavery has gotten them out of the barrel. And now they've found a voice. So this argument continues until some hot-headed Southerners fires at Fort Sumter. Now look at the South. This is this, this, look at the whole situation because really this is a family fight between whites and whites. It's not much of a civil war because now the Southern candidates, cadets at West Point had the choice of choosing to fight for the South or to fight for the North. Most of the Southern cadets decided to return home and fight for the North, fight for the South. Now, the South Fought like hell in the South, gave a splendid account of themselves because they had no place to go back up against the war, fighting an industrial part of the United States that could outproduce it. Now, people began to make opportunists out of this war. Several families began to sell to the North and the South and laid the basis of their fortune selling to both. And among those who made fortunes was the former governor of New, United, of, of New York City, Herbert Lehman. Herbert Lehman's family. A lot of families, a lot of people sold to both sides. Now, the South did not want black troops. The North didn't want them either. But things got so difficult the South began to have black quartermasters, I mean laboring troops, wagon masters, quartermasters just to deliver food and keep the supplies. He's a few were fighting men, but only a few in the South. But in New England, they raised several regiments, grew in the famous um, um, black regiment from. Connecticut and the, and the like to distinguish itself, distinguish itself so well that in one battle, that regiment won 16 Congressional Medals of Honor. It has never been done before or since because America decided that blacks, even if he was brave, he, he would not be warded that way ever again. To the extent that an order went out that no blacks would get the Congressional Medal of Honor during the Second World War. And nobody got it. It had nothing to do with bravery. If you were to get the Congressional Medal of Honor, then your commander must write you up and recommend you for it. 
and no white commander would dare inasmuch as a secret order had been circulated in the army against the idea of giving blacks Congressional Medals of Honor. Now, this is why. There's a little known stipulation in the Congressional Medal Award that any Congressional Medal of Honor winner can on demand ask to address the combined houses of the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives. No one ever did it, but they fear that if it was ever going to be done, <laughs> maybe a black will get up there and speak his piece. <laughs> and there's nothing in law they could have done to stop it because that is part of the stipulation. And then in the, in the war in Korea, most of the blacks who got it, got it posthumously, I mean, after they died. In the war in Vietnam, three who got it, most of them were crazy. One was in the medics. He went to see Eisenhower. I saw him on the news wheel. He said that I didn't win this medal for my country. I didn't win this medal. I didn't win this medal for my company. I didn't win this medal, you know, for, uh, for my country myself. I won this medal for my country. <laughs> he said, I said, that fool, that fool ain't going to be no harm to nobody. <laughs> Another one went back to Detroit having won the medal. And blacks razzed them so, said, what you over there killing those little brown people for and getting a medal? You think you big stuff. No Vietnamese ever called you nigger. What you killing them for? And just to prove he was brave, he started holding up grocery stores until finally one man beat him on the draw and he went on to meet his maker. So those that did get it, didn't turn out to be much. <laughs> All right, now back to the Civil War. Because a whole lot of blacks fought in the Civil War, fought exceptionally well in the Civil War, won medals, saved companies. And Abraham Lincoln himself said, and this is in... Um, one of Lincoln's uh, diaries, except for the blacks on the Potomac, guarding the Potomac, the Southerners would have taken Washington. Blacks guarded that capital and guarded it well. Guarded it so well until one night Abraham Lincoln was coming home and for some reason didn't have his stovepipe hat. So he challenged the president at the gate to the White House. Who goes there? He said, President, president of what? <laughs> <laughs> he said, president of the country. You don't look like no president to me. Where's your hat? <laughs> Turned him back. Finally, the captain of the guards came and identified Lincoln and led him in the White House. The next morning, Lincoln, thinking that this soldier might be punished for such treatment, Lincoln had literally recommended he be promoted for doing his job so well. Lincoln said, if he stopped me from going in the White House, I know no spy can get in here. <laughs> so Lincoln ordered him to be promoted that next day. But... Uh, Blacks gave a splendid account of themselves, not only in the war, but there was another side of the war. Blacks served as spies and agents, 
among those was Sojourner True, I mean, uh, Harriet Tugman, who had gone into the South and freed any number of slaves and never let a slave turn back. You things get rough, they want to turn back and go back to the plantation. She said, I'll kill you right here first. Ain't nobody going back. I'll kill you and bury you right here. She followed the stars in the skies until she got them out. And so, when the war was over, Lincoln was reluctant to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Wrote several drafts. Finally, it was signed. He freed the slaves in states where he had no control, but he didn't free them in states where he did have control. He freed them as a tactic to weaken the South and hasten the end of the war. He had said if he could save the Union and free the slaves, he would do it, and if he could save the Union and hold the slaves, he would do it. We were not an issue. Our, our freedom was not an issue. Now, he issued his Emancipation Proclamation, wasn't even popular with his cabinet, wasn't popular with the country. Where would these slaves go? In parts of Texas, they did not even get the news to the slaves, and they did not become emancipation, emancipated until June the 10th. This is why you've got a, the only black holiday in the United States that is celebrated is Juneteenth in Texas. If you want to get drunk and curse out a white man in Texas, do it on Juneteenth. He lets you get away with it on that day. That's your emancipation day. The rest of the week, you straighten up. <laughs> but now, we were facing new problems and some old ones. Some of us could vote now. After Lincoln was shot, there was some wonder about what would happen to us, had, what would have happened to us had Lincoln lived. <laughs> Lincoln had a plan of getting us out of here, and he said that he did not believe any of us could behave in social company equal to white. So if you want to know what would have happened had Lincoln not been shot, and I'm sorry he was shot, <laughs> but he would have at least tried to get us out of here because he didn't think we were suitable to the new climate in the United States. I'm not talking about the physical climate, I'm talking about the political climate. And after the Civil War when he address some Southerners to show how he was still a Southerner at heart, the first thing he said was, let the band play Dixie. Now, if you want to know who made Lincoln a great hero, you did. You were the ones who hailed Lincoln. Whites caricatured him and spoke of him lower than they speak of dogs. You hailed him as the great emancipator and you, as a, you joined the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln and, you know, and followed Mr. Lincoln's party, you know, and were under, not going to deviate. And one of our great orators, Roscoe Simmons Conklin, all of you must be too young to remember the great Roscoe Simmons Conklin, world's greatest orator. I thought he was a greater showman. He always ended his speech and said that I have but one 
party. It is the Republican Party. I have but one race. It is the human race. And having hailed Lincoln, he would sit down amid great applause, Brocktail, Colt, and all. <laughs> great Roscoe Simmons Conklin. But we hailing Lincoln as the great emancipator gave Lincoln a presence as a hero in America he otherwise would not have. And the first person to write a favorable book about Lincoln was an Englishman. John Drinkwater wrote a favorable book about Lincoln. Now the ambulance of books about Lincoln as a folk hero began to flood the country. But after he was shot, unfortunately, a President Johnson, who was almost impeached, except for one vote, he would have been impeached, he was so inept, couldn't understand anything, misunderstood Lincoln's instructions, and he would have done us in, but he didn't have the, enough intelligence to even know how. So he continued some of the programs already on the book, not knowing that they didn't believe in those programs in the first place. Now the Freedmen's Bureau was set up, a bureau for the freeman, Freedmen's Bank, for 11 years. We enjoyed pseudo-democracy. We had congressmen, 23 in all, had males, probably more males for one time than we got right now. Not that any of them of any value to us. Symbolically, yes. Males go best to Texas. Males in the Deep South. Blacks were head of treasurer, I mean treasurers of state. In North Carolina, they had a majority in the House for a brief uh, period. We made the mistake that we nearly always make when things are partially good. We don't plan for the time when they won't be good anymore. Now, the blacks united with the poor whites in the South. And they introduced some of the best legislation ever introduced in this country because the blacks had no money for private schools and neither did the poor whites. They introduced the basis of the American public school. And we know, what did these black legislators do? The Southerners maligned them, so they came into the Legislator eating peanuts and, you know, with a flask of corn liquor in the pocket, which has never been proven to be true. The whole birth of the nation bit. But these were some able men. George Eliot, Brown Eliot was an able man. I mean, there were some great, not only some great legislators, some great orators, and some great thinkers come out, came out of it, out of this same menu, out of this same atmosphere came Pinchback, who was Lieutenant Governor of New Orleans, Louisiana, and briefly Governor of Louisiana. I mean, some able, able men. Out of the same group came two senators both from Mississippi, best known Blinch Calsco Bruce. Bruce, after he was no longer senator, then he was register <coughs> of the treasurer and going home on a Jemco train. But they, they hadn't broken, the Jemco starts at Washington. And so he was in Washington and they, they hadn't broken the cars down so blacks would be in one section, the whites would be in the section. So he was sitting there and 
Incidentally, his old slave master was talking to another old slave master. I wonder what happened to that old young slave I had named Bruce. Smart as a whippersnapper. Well, no, didn't know what happened to him. Had a little education, too. Don't know how he got it. Bruce sitting behind him. Bruce took out a dollar and showed them. That's what happened to him. He's now Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> ended the mystery, ended the conversation. But we were so busy celebrating this pseudo-integration, this experiment in racial democracy that a whole lot of people didn't mean. And this could come about because the, the Southerners who were in political power doing the Civil War, who brought on the Civil War, were now barred from political office. Barred from political office, this gave some poor whites and blacks an opportunity they never had before. And together, they began to make the legislation that would change the South. Then certain black and white organizations began to emerge on the eve of the time when the old God Southerners would be permitted to return to public office. The Colored and White Farmers Alliance, that's what frightened them. Just like Martin Luther King's Poor People's March on Washington taking both white and black poor, frightened the nation, and they ended up killing him. Now blacks were, were, were advocating a union between poor blacks and poor whites, and the poor wh whites were going for it. What could they lose? They were poor. Their status wasn't much better than the slaves. Now a political thing would happen during the election campaign of R Rutherford B. Hayes and Tilden, horse trading would take place and an exchange for the Democrats, the Democratic vote, the re radical Republicans turned conservative and said that if you vote and throw the election for Hayes, we will pull the troops out of the South and let you handle the Negroes as you see fit. They elected Hayes, and the horse traders kept their promise. They pulled the troops out of the South. They gradually began to dismantle the Freedmen's Bureau and the Freedmen's Bank. The promise about 40 acres and a mule was withdrawn. We were on the edge of some dark days in this country without any friends, any place. In the midst of this, we had to build institutions. We had to get a college education. We had to literally borrow teachers from New England, the New England school mom period. This is the period when a group of white women in New England, the first educated white women in the New England states, white men in New England, mostly non-college graduates, didn't know what to do with uh, college-bred woman, didn't know what to say to her. Can't chase her to the kitchen, because all he thought of a good the woman was good for is the kitchen, the church, and the bad children. Now, these educated white women began to retreat 
moved to the South in large number to teach in the new schools established for blacks. Sometimes the Ku Klux Klan burned down the school. Some of them persisted. Some of them gave up, married Southerners, and became Southerners. But this was a period that tested us as we've never been tested before. This is the period when we had a dynamic ministry, a more dynamic church. It's a period when we gave up old troubles and took on new troubles. And I'm saying the caliber of black man and woman that came out of that last part of that century called the Nadir, or our darkest hour, speaks well for us as a people, speaks well for any, any people. And if we in the 20th century knew what they were up against and how they fought and won some battles, losing some, Odds we never faced, odds we could not even believe. But these were the valid men and women of caliber. Or not only in this country, but in the Caribbean island and in Africa. No TV to expose them, no, no, nothing, no help. No press releases against all kinds of odds. They gave this people the strong shoulders and the ability to move down to the end of the 19th century and the ability to enter the 20th century. These were our men and women of valor. And in the period after the Civil War, this was our finest generation. Thank you. Clark will, as, uh, uh, as is customary, um, take questions. Um, we'll give him a chance to, to rest up. And while I take the opportunity to, to make some announcements, um, those of you who have questions, uh, please line up early because just in consideration for Dr. Clark, uh, I do kind of arbitrarily cut off the questioning and, and people always, people always entitled AIDS and the African-American community. I always find that AIDS is, is for most of us, for most people, a exciting topic when it is here, sit here. Sit, sit. Okay. that AIDS is an exciting topic when we're talking about it within the framework of uh, Dr. Welsing and, and uh, bad blood, and many of you know much of the, the, the literature and the, the rumor that is circulating in our communities about the management of AIDS and the like. And we get very excited about AIDS in that regard when we can point a finger and talk about the conspiracy that exists. May or may not be true, I'm very familiar with a lot of that material. And I believe a lot of that material. But as uh, Dr. Amos Wilson said several weeks ago from this same podium, now that that's our belief, now that we, we understand that there may be a management aspect of AIDS, what do we do about it? It is still here. Well, our health division is addressing that problem from a what do we do about it perspective, from a management perspective, from, from a perspective that, that sets aside the origin but says we have a critical condition in our communities and we must deal with it. 
and it is at that point that I notice the interest seems to abate. Somehow, when it comes to what we can do about it in detailed ways, in learning the facts, somehow or another the interest seems to wane. And so I am imploring those of you who are interested in this crisis, in your communities, to take advantage of the, um, the uh, lecture conference next Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at the House of the Lord Church, and that will be the next in the Timbuktu Learning Center series. Additionally, I want to remind you that there is no Dr. Clark lecture next week, but in connection with how he ended his lecture today, on October 15th, Dr. Clark will pick up the series with the fourth in the series entitled Emancipation, Reconstruction, and Betrayal, those years from 1865 to 1895. So we, we, look, forward, we look forward to that. Additionally, I want to remind you of the leadership training seminar with Brother Charles Barron and uh, Brother Paul Washington to begin October 19th at 7.30. Those of you who are interested in that, even if you have no registration fee to put toward it, express your interest to any of the APCO people around the room, particularly in the back. Um, Sister uh, Linda Price would be more than happy to take your names and, and get you started with the involvement in the leadership training seminar. Um, now, for those of you who have questions, um, please I'll meet you over here with the mic and we can continue. Let's welcome back Dr. John Henry Clark. find it difficult to believe that we don't have questions. I mean, I, I can always ask about five or six myself, but I always try not to take advantage of the fact that I'm the one holding the mic, so. Dr. Clark, thank you for your lecture. Um, I have a friend, uh, he's in the military, um, and whenever he gets out, he comes to the lectures, um, he studies, but it seems to me that he has a problem of what to do because he can't really be himself in there and they've just ran a, a program last week on NBC the blacks future in the military and they were saying how we won't have any more generals we won't have any more top officers in the military in the next century going into the next century and they say that it looks bleak and my question to you since I know you've been in the military yourself um, maybe you can explain for everybody here what maybe might be the future of, of black people in or involved with U.S. military, and if they are involved, are there any applications for us as African people that we could help ourselves with, with that learning or training? Well, that's unfortunate because America made up its mind, just like they made up its mind that there would be no... Uh, that Congressional Medal of Honor winners in the Second World War, the Marines have announced long ago that while there might be black generals in other branches of the service, there will be no black Marine general. See, now qualifications had nothing to do with it. That's a decision that they've made that Marines will not be led in battle by a black general. And what you have to understand that this is a part of the sentiment of this country is turning against us. The gun law in Florida is partly really against us. And that the tide is rising against us in this country. And if we had it together and if Pan-Africanism meant anything, we would go and serve in armies in Africa and be generals and be whatever we need to be, and captains of industry too. And I'm not talking about capitalist exploitation of Africa. I would be against that no matter who's doing it. I mean, exploit Africa 
for the sake of African people to build schools and to build facilities in Africa for Africans. Let them get the benefit of all that, that well. There was a book uh, called Who Needs the Negro? A lot of people didn't read it. But they, uh, what the book was saying is that they consider us obsolete in this country. We, come to, we were brought here to do some labor. The labor was over. They can manage without us now. They didn't bring us here to give us democracy. And we don't seem to be, to be able to realize that. The country is not relaxed if you are a part of it in the true sense. But then where are we going to go if we don't stay here? There's not a single country in Africa told us to come home. That's the tragedy. We have not built up the kind of relationships to break through all the propagandized minds in Africa so the Africans could see what a great value we would be to them. But all the basic technical knowledge we have, we could revolutionize and industrialize Africa. In a little while, Africa will be producing everything it needs. No one has made this idea work uni universally. Now, when I, I was in the Army four years, two months, 26 days. <laughs> no. But as a clerk, a chief clerk, a master sergeant, a personnel sergeant major, I made the Army serve black people. And if I was convicted for all the different things I did in the Army, all the different laws I violated, I'd still be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> but I had no illusion about it. Some colonel asked me in the army, because my men were the cleanest, neatest, best dressed, less venereal disease than any company in the whole Eighth Corps area. Some grinning colonel come congratulated me, said, Sergeant, how do you instill such patriotism in these boys? <laughs> 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 well, know what I told them? I went, I didn't call them a formation and told them, went from one bag to the other. I said, you walk this earth like kings because you are kings. You are too proud to carry disease in your body and, and, to, and to give it to one of your women. So don't do this for your company. Don't do it for your country that has betrayed you. Do it for yourself because you are a king and that's the way you walk the earth. And if you are a king, your women must be queens and they must subsequently be treated like one. He wants to know how I steal such patriotism in these boys. First place I told them, don't bother about being patriotic. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Clark. Um, in listening to your lecture this evening, I was most interested in finding out, you spoke of when uh, Afro-Americans first stopped identifying themselves as Africans. What I would like to know is what was going on in their psyche that caused them to stop identifying themselves as Africans? The bad image of Africa in the geography books and in the press of that day if you, or the, the bad caricature of Africa, plus the fact that we had not made the connection with Africa that would make us welcome. The blacks who went to Liberia went with the announcement that they were going to civilize their heathen brothers. So therefore, we had a bad attitude toward Africans. They had a bad attitude toward us. We haven't cleared it up to this day.
Otep. Uh, you talked about the, Mar the Maroons yeah. in Jamaica. I want to know if the Maroons were also in the United States and in other parts of the Caribbean, and what were their roles in these other parts, if they were there? No, there were Maroons all over the whole New World. And uh, Herbert Aptek has written an essay on the Maroons in the United States. There's a good book by uh, Faulkner Watts on the Maroons of Haiti. But the most colorful of the Maroons were those in Jamaica. There were Maroons in Guyana who brought off the famous Bob Beast Revolt. The Maroons all over the uh, revolts in Brazil was led by Maroons. The word Maroon just means runaway slave. It's no big deal. <laughs> I mean, so any slave who was run away was, uh, was called, a, could be called a maroon. A lot of people think only Jamaica had maroons. Jamaica had the most publicized maroons. But there were maroons all over. In this country, they were in the mountains of Kim.